Hello, thanks for watching. I'm John Windsor Cunningham. Three stories about acting. Uh, when I was 16 years old, I got my first job as an actor and I really didn't have a clue about acting. I lied about my age. I was tall. I looked okay. And I got this job in this theatre company in England, a sort of summer stock company, where you did a different play every week. And the standard wasn't very high, but I was almost just, uh, just uh, terrible. I didn't have a clue. It was before I went to RADA. And when I joined the company, the first thing I learned was that you had to be on time for the half, like in America, uh, half an hour before the performance every night. You have to be there to get ready at the half. And I was told when I started off that there was one actor in the company, an old actor in the company, whom I shouldn't talk to. He was a bit of an idiot and that he'd once been late for the half. And this was sort of said as though it was something, you know, that shouldn't be on the internet. Really terrible, shocking. He was late for the half. And I thought, oh gosh, right. So I realised this was terribly important. You mustn't be late for the half. And I'd been working there for a few months and you can't sack anyone in England. It's different to America. You can kill the director's mother and they can't sack you. You, you, you can't be sacked. Um, and you can't leave the company if you get a better job. It's a different union system. And so they had to put up with my terrible acting. But I'd learnt this one thing about being on time for the half. But I realised after being there for a few months that no one, no one was even a second late for the half. It was like being late for your wedding or not going on stage when the queue for your entrance came. It was just a ridiculous idea. You had to be there for the half. And I realised that this old actor hadn't been late for the half, that it was a story they'd made up about him behind his back to make me dislike him, that they were making it up, that no one could be late for the half, that it was impossible. And I tell you this story because it turned me into a person who was just always rather madly on time. So that's that story. Um, now, uh, the second story is about great acting. Great acting. Uh, when I was younger, I, I went to theatre a lot, and, and so I've been very lucky. I've seen great acting twice. And it sounds very rude of me, but lots of people have never had the good luck to see I've seen wonderful acting, or brilliant acting, or exciting acting, but great acting, actors at their best, is something else. I've seen an audience of 1,400 people leave a theatre in silence. They were so shocked, they were suffering from shock at what they'd seen, that they didn't believe what they'd seen was possible. No one spoke till they got out into the street. It was like the first time that a young Russian girl did a double backward somersault from a standing position and landed on her feet. It was supposed to be impossible. It was an Olympic trial in Berlin and we were all standing around in this square and sitting around and no one applauded. No one went whoop. No one smiled. It was as if someone from some being from Mars had landed. We just stood there shocked because we didn't think it was supposed to be possible to jump up in the air, do a double backward somersault and land from a standing position. It was supposed to be impossible. And when people saw John Malkovich on the stage do Burn This in London, they would come back again and again to see it because they didn't believe it was possible for a man to be so strong on stage. They'd never seen it before. So strong. He was a giant, a giant on earth. To see someone being an American aristocrat with a pride that we'd never seen before, ever. We couldn't believe it was possible. It was amazing. And right for the part, of course. And when Gene Wilder, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful actor on film, Gene Wilder, but on the stage when he did, uh, what was it, Laughter on the 23rd Floor. 
a good play, but um, when he th there's a scene in it when he he'd built up this tension of things going wrong, so that at one point he was able to stand on the stage and not move for a minute, not move for a whole minute. He didn't move, twinkle his eyes, he didn't half smile. He just stood there, and we knew he was thinking, but he didn't look as though he was thinking, he just was thinking. And we knew that he was going through this amazed shock thing that he'd built up to in the play. And for a minute we all laughed. It was as though he'd invented comedy. We'd never seen this before. We'd never laughed like this before, ever. We'd never seen that kind of laughing at a man just standing there. It was perfection, and I mention this only because it means that it's possible. It's possible to be great. It's possible to be that good. I didn't see Gene Hackman on the stage, much to my regret. And there are one or two others I'd like to have seen on the stage, who I think would have been even better than on film. Olivier, I've seen probably, yes, I've seen him being great once. I've seen Olivier being great once. And it's just astonishing. You just sit aghast. And it's possible to get that. That's the point of the story. My third story <laughs> is about something I feel I've been doing wrong in my coaching. I've taken up quite a lot of time just explaining to people what subtext means, what is behind lines all the time. And I've realised now it can all be said in eight words, which I'm going to say now, that the secret that makes one performance better than another at auditions, that what they've got behind the lines, when someone's line is good morning and your line is yes or right, then their line good morning probably means you're late. So they're going to say good morning. And your line yes or right means I'm sorry, so you're going to say yes or right. And, but this having to think about what the line means, really, can all be explained in eight words. Much more simply, I now realise, if you can get it, if you understand these eight words. When your mother says to you, do you like my hair? And you say, yeah, yeah, I think it's great. You don't think about the fact that you're telling her you love her and that she wants you to, to know if you love her. You just naturally re react. Subtext, three, four, five, six, seven, eight words, Subtext is reacting to another person's subtext. Thank you for watching.